Okay. All right, so looking at chapter 13, we're looking at 13.3. Let me just get in there. Hold on one second to one. So apart from taking the standard home deduction, you can also do the cost home deduction. Well, there's two options on a Schedule C. And let me just get Schedule C open here. Okay. All right, so we're down here at the bottom. And if you, oops, if you notice, we got, uh, we got our tentative profit, as it says, okay? Because we got line seven, subtracting line 28. Then we get in line 30, and there it talks about attached form 8829, unless using the simplified method, okay? So, well, it's $5 a square foot. $5 a square foot. Yep, so if you look there, there's two little things just like at the top. If we go to the 8829, that we have for the business use of the home. At the top, there's a little thing that talks about, you know, the the um, the percentage to get the percentage of the home used. Okay, and then it goes down to the bottom where you do two methods. Okay, so on this case for uh, Mr. Barnum, I have a area used is 180. Okay. Total square footage of the home is 1,900, okay? So we're saying 9.47% of his home is used, okay? That being said, when we go down here to the bottom, we can see all the things that we can relate to our home office, okay? And remember, we talked on the Schedule A. I said I'd come back to it. This is where we get into that. If you take a look, deductible mortgage interest, okay? We have two columns. We have direct and indirect, okay? If we have a building that is it, that's all that it's used for, 100%. exactly. But in this case, we're having a home office. So if he had mortgage and stuff, you put it indirect, then it uses that 9.47%. So basically, all you're taking here is utilities because the website you assume would be 100% business. Mm -hmm. Insurance, 500, would that be on the whole building or would that be business insurance? Probably business insurance. All right. So really, when you look at all this, all this is business insurance, except for the only thing different is the percentage of the uh, utilities. Mm -hmm. right. Yep. So, you know, and that's why I say in this one, you know, so then what happens is this is worth two. If I do an indirect on this and say that he has mortgage interest of $5,000, okay, you can see that it calculated over here in the column using it, so that's what he could take. Now, if I go to my Schedule A, here you can see on his interest, the remainder came over. So that's where we can do that. So, well, we got 474 there, that's what his basic is. If I go back to my 8829, I'm gonna take out any expenses there. Okay, because really all he had was utilities, indirect, correct? So we're looking at $88. If we go back to the Schedule C, whoops, take that out of there. If we go back to the Schedule C, page two, there is a, whoops. Okay, part two here we had uh, simplified method, okay? Now, be very careful on this, because what do you notice about um, these two numbers and the way you enter them? On the other sheet, what's first? The business, the, the, the square foot for the business, and then the total. This one's just the opposite. You put the square root, of the, I don't know why they did that, so, but it's flip-flopped, okay? So we got total square footage of the home is 1,900. Okay, and he uses 180 square feet. All right, now, what does that get him? Well, $900, right? Right. So, it's a lot more than 10% of the utility. Yep, yep. So, you know, that's probably the better. But remember about that, and this is why it's positioned the way it is on the Schedule C. We have our tentative profit, okay? 
can't create a loss. Exactly. However, what about depreciation now on the part of the building? But we don't have any information on that. But yeah, that would be true. Comes to play. Depreciation on the building? Well, let's say you take the 1500 now you take in depreciation of the building. What's, what's the 1500 I thought it was a minimum $1,500. That's what we were. I thought that we were allowed $1,500 for our, our markets. Minimums. There's no minimum. Wasn't there? Some reason we put $1,500. It was a $1,500. Maybe a yeah, there's really no minimum or, or maximum. The maximum would come into play is, like I said, you can't create more of a loss or make a loss. But, you know, that $5 square foot is always working out better than that. So, but, uh, you know, that's where it comes into play um, so that it's in there for the net profit or loss. But again, what happens, like, what did we find with mileage? Once we do what? Yeah, when the IRS introduces a method, you know, if you decide to do one or the other, you gotta stay with it. So, you can't, uh, you know, there's some things that, you know, if you... We'll flip back to here. Exactly, exactly. exactly. You get 179 a vehicle for the whole amount, so you don't create a loss. And then after that, you can take the you know, mileage. You do what now? You get 179 a truck. That's directly sold for the business? Sold for the business and business by the yeah. They take 100% deduction against income. Mm -hmm. However, after that, you can do either the mileage or the actual expenses. Yeah. Regardless of the 179. And that may be a case where you want to visit the actual. Right. Because, you know, you know it's 100%. It's so when yeah, you, go, you, can only go, you can only go one way or the other once you make that. Yes. Was it when that one's put in service? Now, if you get a new one, right? You change. Yeah. yeah, just like we see with mileage, or you know, a car or whatever. We can't flip flop back and forth. And sometimes, uh, you know, let's see. I'm trying to think. Um, I have a couple guys, uh, friends that they do a um, partnership. I don't know. Why I'm trying to get them out of it, but they're still paying self employment tax. But uh, the two of them, uh, they do. They lay carpet, and actually, their niche is putting carpet in um, sound places to soundproof it. So they carpet walls instead of floors um, and ceilings. So that's kind of their niche. But they have a van and, and they bought a new one, but it was an older van. So we visited the fact that, you know, is this thing gonna have, you know, a higher mileage vehicle? Is it gonna be better, you know, actual. Be do actual because down the line we may have a transmission or an engine or something like that. So, yeah. All right. So we have that on there, okay. All right, so that was J.P. Barnum, okay? Like I said, most of the time, you know, they're going to have things that are going to be income that are going to come to them on a 1099, so that's where we're going to see most of that. All right. Okay, now, we're going to get into depreciation. Well, let's say chapter 14. As you can see on that, we have uh, what we were just talking about a little bit, depreciation, business use of the home, uh, clergy, self-employed health insurance deduction, and the self-employment tax, okay? So a lot of things happen in this chapter that are kind of results of us doing a Schedule C and where it disperses to on the return, all right? Depreciation is an income tax deduction that allows a taxpayer to recover the cost or other basis of certain property. It is an annual allowance for the wear and tear, deterioration, or obsolescence of the property, okay? Um, the property ceases to be depreciable when the, the taxpayer has fully recovered the property's cost or other basis, or when the taxpayer retires the property from service, whichever happens first, okay? So basically we're getting into it, and what is depreciation on its bare essence? And I always tell everybody, don't get caught up in the whole depreciation word. It's an expense. And what are we able to do with that expense? Well, yeah, but as far as the expense, as opposed to typical expense when we have it, when do we take it when we're on a cash basis? In a year, in the year that it happens. When you have something that you can depreciate, what are you able to do with that expense? 
separated over other years. Can you, can you use depreciation to create a loss? Yes. Yep. So it will calculate in there. Like I said, really the only thing on the Schedule C that you have to worry about is after we get to that tentative profit, that's where, you know, that home office cannot make it more negative. Okay. All right. So we have that. Um, individuals who are not employees, including independent contractors and those who own their own business, must report and pay full self-employment tax. That's their Social Security and Medicare. However, there is a 50% deduction, viable, and adjustment to income. We talked about that on the bottom of page 1040, page one. Kind of introduced it, what it is, you know, so that we'll kind of come back to that, okay? So we're going to talk about how to determine entered depreciation on Schedule C, uh, business use of the home. We're going to talk a little bit about clergy, okay? Uh, complete Schedule SC, determine self-employment tax, and understand self-employment tax exemptions as they apply to clergy and statutory employees, okay? I do. I do. Yep. So, uh, Steve Jacobson, that used to work for uh, EG Tax, um, he his wife got a great job down in Jersey at uh, one of the universities, and he went down there. And actually, what he did is he opened a tax firm, and that's all they do is clergy returns. Um, I have a girl in the night class that her husband um, is a member of the clergy, and uh, they had their. Return done the first time by H and R Block, and whoever did it did not understand all the little nuances with house leasing allowances and stuff like that. They were shocked when they got the return. And they had this huge refund because most of the time clergy will not see that because of the self-employment tax that they pay on their housing allowance. So depending on how their W two works, okay. Yeah, I have a couple, and it's amazing when we get returns that have been clergy's how wrong people do them. So, all right, depreciation, property on page 14 core, property acquired for use in business with an expected lifetime of more than one year generally cannot be expensed in a year acquired, okay? And it says generally. We'll talk a little bit more about specific things when we get into that, okay? Most types of tangible property such as buildings, machinery, vehicles, furniture, and equipment are depreciable. However, land is not. Okay, so we'll always see that. We'll talk about that more when we get into rentals, when you have the basis for the rental and you usually have to back out the value of the land that sits with that rental, okay? Uh, certain intangible property is depreciable. Some intangible property must be amortized, okay? Things like patents, copyrights, and computer software, all right? Um, seeing that computer software came up, what do we find in this day and age with computer software? Does it really have a more than one year useful life? Oh, yeah. You know, just so I was talking earlier about Office 365, stuff like that. I mean, how often in less than a year are you having to do an upgrade or change or a new version or whatever it is? And a lot of times, you know, it almost becomes a line item expense as opposed to something you can depreciate or amortize. So, uh, to be eligible for depreciation, the property must meet all the following requirements. The taxpayer must own the property, okay? The taxpayer must use the property in business for an income-producing activity. If a taxpayer uses the property for business and personal use, they can only deduct that for the business use. We can, uh, we'll show how there's a percentage. And the property must have an eternal useful life of more than one year, okay? And again, said generally up above and the terminal life. Again, software, you know, the day and age, even even computers themselves, you know, depending on what you're doing with it and what you're doing, you know, sometimes, you know, places, it, even printers, you know, I'm fascinated. Uh, we're looking for a new printer for the house for my wife because she's got to do some presentation stuff. You know, when you're buying a printer, you're almost more looking at the cost of the, the cartridges or the for the lasers to see what those are than the cost of the printer because some of them, it's almost cheaper to buy the printer over and over again and not, you know, throw it away and not buy the replacement cartridges. So it's fascinating. So especially when you're looking at laser color printers. So good thing that her office is, or her employer is paying for it. All right, even if a taxpayer meets the preceding requirements, a taxpayer cannot depreciate the following property. Property placed in service and disposed in the same year. Okay, kind of makes sense. 
Uh, equipment used to build a capital improvements. A taxpayer must add otherwise allowable depreciation and equipment during the period of construction to the basis of the improvements. Okay. A taxpayer must identify several items to ensure property depreciation of property, including the depreciation method, the class life, whether the property is listed, whether the taxpayer elects to expense any portion of the asset. Um, Patrick's brought this up a lot of times, we'll bring up that section 179. And basically, what is that? And again, when I'm talking about somebody that doesn't have accounting experience or doesn't have depreciation, I'm just saying, okay, we have an expense. Depreciation allows us to chop up the expense into little pieces over the life. Each year we're using it, all right? If you decide that because your income in that first year, you want to front load all those pieces, that's 179, okay? What's that? But you can't create a loss. Yeah. Well, and that might be the case. That's where some of that net operating loss comes in. Yeah. So, and that's where net operating loss, you know, you got to do a little explanation and stuff like that. So when the taxpayer qualifies for any bonus first year depreciation, that's special depreciation allowance. And what is that? So 179, we do what? Expense. All in one year. Five. Special allowable, what are we doing? 50%. Yeah. So we're only front loading a little bit and then taking the remainder over the little pieces. So let's assume you, you have a profit of 20 grand and you get an expense for the sales and you want to win 79, 20,000 against that, but can you depreciate the remaining 20,000? Not if you do 179, but if you do special, you can. In other words, how would I 179 and, and depreciate the balance? That's a special depreciation. I'll show you how that works on the sheet. So that would work. Exactly. And again, you know, some of that is talking with your client and really finding out what is the future of their business and the income flow? Right. You know, when we're looking at a startup that's buying a bunch of assets, right. you know, do we want to waste everything up front? Right. Or do we want to say, hey, year two or three, we could end up with some pretty good sales. We want to have something. And once we're in a higher tax bracket, it'll make sense to, to expense more. Yeah, exactly. Why not make money. Once you put that vehicle in, once you decide you, the vehicle is replaced, say, for example, it's in good production, you need to appreciate it. You can't then change it to a one seven. Oh, no, no. And, and again, I'll show you on the sheets when we get into the 4562 and we're doing that, you know, it lights up red for you. And as you make that decision on the spot, whether you, what you want to take. And again, that's a discussion you have with your client. Okay. You can't carry that forward. What? The one seventy-nine Election? Yeah. So I can't, I can't take the whole 40. I can take 20 now, but why can't I take 20 next year? Yeah, that's where you make that election. Special allowance instead. Yep. So. Special yep. And then just hope that your income flow matches what your intention was with the depreciation. All right. Uh, next, we have uh, makers, mackers, whatever you want to call it. Here we go into acronyms. I love it. It's like talking to my wife when she's in the military. What's that mean? All right. Uh, accelerated cost recovery system. Makers, mackers, whatever. Tomato, tomato, potato, potato. Okay. Um, is a beach property placed in service before 1987? Most property used in the acres method has been completely depreciated. The makers modified accelerated cost recovery system is the property depreciation method for most property applies to business investment property placed in service after 1986. Okay. What's another method that comes into play? What's the old fashioned one that most CPAs always talked about? Oh, the straight line. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, computing depreciation, uh, the IRS defines recovery periods and certain allowable depreciation methods. Date placed in service, obviously, depreciation begins when you placed it in service, okay, for the business. That means ready and available for specific use, whether in trade or business, all right? Determining a property's basis. Uh, the depreciated property, its basis must be determined. The basis is often the acquisition cost adjusted for certain items. Okay. What would that be? What, what, what can we adjust on our depreciation? What if I bought the special press to make my widgets? What would something else that I could put on the basis that maybe cost? Installation? Yeah. So, you know, it's, they have to come in and 
you know, this thing runs on gas or, you know, has to have a special outlet or a special electricity circuit, okay? Uh, depreciation allowed or allowable, when depreciating a property and later recapturing depreciation if necessary, the amount of depreciation to be recaptured is larger than the amount actually depreciated or the amount that was, where does that come in? Well, some people can get the depreciation of their property for five, six, seven years and all of a sudden, they're gonna have to be nailed with it anyway. Yeah, and when we get into Schedule E's, if somebody sells rental and they haven't depreciated, what's the IRS perspective? They don't care, you're paying back, you know. Too bad, so sad, you know. So, and we see that a lot of times with people coming in that, you know, have done the returns on their own or somebody else that hasn't done the depreciation correct. Uh, property class, we'll kind of talk about that, uh, the, all the different ones. We'll show that in the 4562, and the recovery period is the number of years that is pre determined, okay? Depreciation methods, we got makers, we have a declining balance method, all right? Yeah, all right, we have what we talked about. Number two, straight line method, all right? Same amount for each year of the recovery period. All right. For example, we have a $500 refrigerator, five-year property, divide one by five, the recovery period, the annual depreciation is $500, the basis times 20%, so $100, that makes sense. The first and last year's deductions are prorated depending upon the date placed in service. So we're gonna get into what? Mid-month, half year? Yep, so, okay. And again, we'll talk about it. The software is very good about, you know, when you select the property class and when you put the in date service that it helps you with that, okay? Well, will that dictate whether it's Americans or straight line? No. no. It's much more the convention. So um, you'll either choose one or the other yourself. Yeah, yep, yeah. you know, it depends when you put in service. Because obviously, if you buy something in December, What's going to happen? You get straight away. You get the one month. The fact is, you get the whole year. Well, it depends. If it was that time of year, and it probably would it wouldn't be the half year convention. Yeah. The others. Yep. 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 Okay. Depreciation systems, as we talked about there, Macers consists of two systems: general depreciation, um, and then alternative depreciation. Um, We'll see that on 4562, but uh, the 14-7 has a great table to kind of help you uh, probably have that discussion with the client when they're choosing how they're gonna depreciate something, okay? All right. Uh, great chart on 14-8 where it starts to talk about our uh, maker's recovery periods, okay? All right. And you can see some of them differ a little bit on the number of years, um, you know, as far as how long you take them. Um, These people have obviously never owned a rental property. Five years? That's the period for them. Well, the same thing. When you're looking at appliances, how many refrigerators in your rentals or stoves are lasting nine years? So, all right. Yep. Exactly. So, um, you know, again, you look at these years and stuff like that. Um, Conventions, that's where we talk about the following conventions are defined, okay? Defensions, uh, half-year convention treats all properties if it is placed in service at the midpoint of the year. Half-year is used for most property except property subject to mid-quarter convention. You gotta love the, the whole, it's like talking Greek. So I did training last night for the, um, we do Republic Bank, is our bank products for our refund and stuff like that. First slide, all this is there, and then in parentheses, they got the little two-letter codes for it. So the, the other 25 minutes that you're doing this and taking a test, that's all they use. You're going, okay, that is, uh, you know, it's an EA or an RT. That was an RTC. No, that was an RTB, you know. So it's, uh, got to love acronyms. But mid-quarter, uh, residential rental property and non-residential real property, uh, mid-month applies, Okay. Mid-quarter convention used at the total depreciable basis of maker's property placed in service during the last three months of the tax year is more than 40% of the total for the entire year. Mid-month convention used for residential rental property. Okay, so let's kind of go through the examples here. Uh, during the tax year, Tom Martin purchased the following items to use in his rental property. Again, 
we're kind of getting a little ahead of us because we aren't doing rental, but we're going to use this for our conventions. Uh, he elects not to claim the special depreciation allowance. All right, that we kind of talked about that a little bit. So a dishwasher for $400 that he placed in service in January. So what's he going to do for that one? Okay. Uh, used furniture for $400 that he placed in service in September. And a refrigerator for $800 that he placed in service in October. Okay. So as we see down here, the Tom uses the calendar tax year. The total basis of all property placed in service that year is $1,300. That makes sense. We added up all the things we bought. The $800 basis for the refrigerator placed in service during the last three months of the tax year exceeds $520, what is better known as 40%. Remember we were talking up there about mid-quarter? Therefore, Tom must use the mid-quarter convention instead of the half-year convention for all three items. All right, see how that works? So one dictates the other. Sometimes one dictates the other. Yep. So really the dishwasher is lost because you started that in January. Well, you didn't lose it, but you're not going to get to take as much of it. That year. Yeah because it's kind of a weighted thing, because what really dominated the whole calculation, our $800 refrigerator in, in October, okay? So is that because it's the most expensive? You do it that way, or well, because the, the last in place in service? It, both. Oh, really? Yeah, it's really a combination of the two. Nice. So, okay? Yeah. So he's gonna use the big quarter for, for all of these, and they're all gonna be in the same uh, category. In the same calendar year. Yep. So therefore, you know, because, you know, typically what would we see with the January one? He could probably do what? The dishwasher. If we just had the dishwasher, what would we use? Half year. Yeah, half year. Okay. And if we just had the dishwasher and the used furniture, let's kind of add each one to it. What can we still do? I'll still use half year. Yeah, because why? We didn't get to that. 40%. Exactly. Okay. Once we put the other in, now it's changed up. Yep, that late purchase in October dominated it. Okay. They'll fall under five years for this category. Yep. Yep. Recovery period. Yep. Okay. A uh, little bit of residential rental property. Again, I'm going to come back to that when we're in the rental properties. Okay. Um, you know, the big thing that uh, just from one of the bullet points here is that you have the um, separating the cost of land and building. Typically, you know, it, it's, it's very hard. That's a, something with appraisal that they don't typically give you the land and the building separate. Um, most of the, the standard thing that we use is 10%. So that the land is 10% of the basis if, if it's not determinable. Okay. So just kind of remember that. All right, okay. Um, okay, so listed property at the bottom says some listed prop, some property is listed property, uh, must be identified when depreciated and detailed records must be kept on the business portion of the use. All right, it has uh, deduction limits and special rules. All right, listed property includes passenger automobiles and other property used for transportation, property used for entertainment, recreation, and amusement, computers and related peripheral equipment. I love the IRS, they still call it data handling. Okay, doesn't that go back to the days of feeding punch cards in? All right, so we have on that. Listed property used more than 50% for business is qualified property for, here's your cue, Patrick. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. So we kind of reduce it. If the taxpayer is an employee using listed property for performing services as an employee, the following requirements must be met in order to claim a deduction for depreciation. The property must be used for the employer's convenience, not the taxpayer's convenience. And the use of the property must be required as a condition of taxpayer's employment. All right. That's a pretty narrow, you know, stipulation on it, okay? 
Property used less than 50% for business has a special rules for calculating depreciation. Property is not qualified for a Section 179 election. Property must be depreciated using straight line method over the ADS recovery period. And excess depreciation in property previous used 50% or more for qualified business expense must be recaptured in the first year in which it is no longer used for 50%. So in other words, if you had a rental property and you moved into it or whatever, and you had a rental property and you had a rental property and you had a rental property and you had a yeah, so that's where we see sometimes where we have to do a lot of calculation for somebody that's been living in a double. Besides that, uh, you know, the single guy bought a double in the city. And, you know, that's been one of his income things. He gets married, the wife doesn't want to live in the double. So what are they going to do? Move out and turn the other half. Now what happens? What's this basically say? Well, it wouldn't affect the his side because he lived in his principal. But now as he moves out, then the depreciation will start at that point in time. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying, let's say he has a, a rental, a rent, and he rents it. Mm -hmm. And he has a rental for 10 years. He's depreciating for 10 years of the rental. Now the wife says, I want to move into it. That's a nice place. This uh -huh. is happening for us. They move in, now all of a sudden it becomes a principal residence. The rental is no longer a rental, so now he's got depreciation recapture. Yep. Which is income. Mm -hmm. Against that property that he moved into, that could be significant. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now back back to your usual comment though, because you made the comment earlier. So is that something that you would place in one of your prenuptials, Patrick? That we're not moving into any rentals I own? Yes. <laughs> so all right. Okay. All right, now we have on 1412, 1413, and 1414, what do we have? Yeah, fun, huh? All right, remember these from your accounting classes, Mark? Oh, yeah. All right, so can you just come up and you'll teach this portion of it? And I can sit down because I hate teaching appreciation. It's hard. It's hard for somebody that doesn't have an accounting background. It's so hard, especially trying to teach them the calculation, okay? So we see each one of these. A subset of tables found in publication 946 is included here for the use of the following example in exercise 14A, okay? So basically we have our um, maker system, we have our depreciation method, our recovery period, our convention, our class, month or quarter placed in service, and that gives us which table to use, all right? Okay, all right. So we have a lot of things to put together, and we'll kind of talk about that when we do some of the problems and some of the exercises here, okay? On page 1415, we get into section 179, deduction. Uh, that is an exception to the general uh, prohibitation, prohib not allowed to, against fully expensing in an asset, okay, in the year required. It allows a taxpayer to expense the cost of all or part of certain qualifying property up to a limit in the year placed in service, okay? In order section 179 must have been acquired by purchase from a non-related person, okay? So you can't be buying assets, Patrick, from your spouse, all right? During the, or children, during the tax year, uh, it may be either new or used, must have been placed in service during the tax year and used predominantly 51% or more in the taxpayer's trade or business. The taxpayer can elect to expense just a portion of the cost, depreciating the balance over the remaining useful life of the property. Uh, Section 179 deduction is subject to both a dollar limit and a business income limit. Okay. Now, Mark, you brought up the fact that the Section 179 gives us the opportunity to do what? That's the entire amounts. What else, based on that last, or based on the um, third bullet, what could we actually do? Um, the taxpayer can elect to expense just a portion of the cost, so we don't have to choose. As opposed to being locked on, locked in under special depreciation allowance, what can we do? Well, on the 179, I've elected to take 75%. Right. And I'll show you on the worksheet within TaxWise, you know, what you put in there. 
How would that be a popular country can create a the loss? What would be the advantage of doing that? Again, you know, when you're trying to have cash flow and you're trying to, you know, Mark brought it up earlier, when you're trying to really match somebody's cash flow and their tax liability or their taxable income or profits, you know, you, you got to do a little forecasting and you would hope a business is such that, yeah, you know, we started in business in October. We didn't have a lot of income, you know, things like that. We're trying to push some of it off, you know, maybe the first two years, we're not going to make that much money by year three. We're going to be. Yep. You know, or sometimes we got, you know, we've got contracts that are being signed, but the income's not coming until next year. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that you just have to look at uh, the cash flow. Okay. Um, depreciable limits on business vehicles. The total Section 179 deduction and depreciation deductible for passenger automobile. This is not a trucker van used in business and first placed in service in 2016 is. 3160 if the special depreciation allowance does not apply. All right. And then it goes through that it's different for place and service if the special depreciation allowance does not apply. Okay. All right. Section 179 carryover. Should the Section 179 deduction exceed the business income limit, all reported the cost may be carried forward. Okay. With planning, it's possible to maximize the benefits of a Section 179 carryover. Considering future income productions allows for a determination of whether it's more advantageous to claim the carryover exceptions of a higher future income or move forward with depreciation instead. Yep, kind of what we were just talking about. Okay. But I don't understand why. The maximum deduction taken for a truck or van used in business, first place in service. It's 3460. You take the total expense of the vehicle. Oh, if the special depreciation does not apply. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. okay. Yep. There's always those little caveats. Okay. So, why wouldn't the special depreciation not apply? Because you But in a case like that, would be, so if I was still looking at my MACRS, I would compare it to that maximum deduction, mm -hmm. right? And uh, just make sure that the table might be saying I can deduct four thousand. Mm -hmm. This is thirty four sixty. We have to we'll use the lower. Yeah, exactly. Or else we're going to get a love letter. Okay. Yeah. Um, page fourteen sixteen special depreciation allowance um, is an additional fifty percent allowance that applies to qualified property that was placed in service during the tax year. This allowance is taken after the section one time. 179 deduction and before figuring regular makers depreciation, proration, proration based on the date of service is not required. Okay. All right. Order to apply at the bottom of 1416, order to apply depreciation options. Because section 179 special deduction are special one time only options. They must be applied first if they are available and the taxpayer chooses to use them. Therefore, the depreciation order is 179 and why? Because we have the option of taking all. all on. Yep. Special depreciation, where's our first year limit? 50%. Exactly. And then the rest of it is our, the state, the regular well, depreciation. Let's, let's say you could take it once or not. You don't force it. No. But again, it's a one-time deal. Right. I understand. Yeah. So we can't just change our mind next year and. The nice thing is, if you take fifty percent of it, because that's what you can take that year, you can carry it forward without. Yeah, without, for the depreciation. Without, oh, why for the depreciation? You're saying take half of the depreciation in the no, first no. year. Let's say, let's say you decide you can take say it's forty thousand. You pay twenty thousand this year. Why can't you take twenty thousand next year? On a one seven one. Because it's got it's one shot deal in the year because you're depreciating the remaining balance over the remaining that's useful life. Uh, the useful the life. Year, it says you can carry it forward to one seventy nine. Uh, where you at? Oh, yeah. well, next year, yeah. it was, uh, should exceed the business income whole or part of the cost may be carried forward must be supported by the planning because of the maximum event once the future income for this without the determine whether it be more advanced to claim the carry over or the business saving or move forward with depreciation instead. So that would imply there that you can take next year I could take the, the balance of the twenty thousand was one seventy nine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the other part of the platform from this is if you 
do take that section 179 and that the business use of that property drop below 50 percent you know, in, a, in a, a year then you'll be subject to that recapture and mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so you always have to make sure because just what, and again, when we get the software and you see where we set up the percentage use, you know, just because, you know, kind of we're talking about the house, you know, you have to ask them, is this still, you know, strictly for the business or did you decide to, you know, put this in your house and use it at home? Right. You know, so you can't be depreciating a refrigerator that you had at the office and then decide. Now it's in the garage. Yeah, now it's in the garage keeping your beer cold. So, all right. What's that? Who would ever know? Well, then we get in the whole gray area about entertaining clients in the garage and, you know, there is a use, so personal use. So, all right. Um, example, pretty good little one here. Jay bought office furniture, seven year property for 10,000 and placed it in service in August 11th, 2016. He was 100% business. This is the only property he placed in service in this year. Why do you think they said that? Yeah, that little thing that we did with the refri or the uh, oven, or, uh, refrigerator, $800 refrigerator. So, um, Jay did not elect a Section 179 deduction, and the property is not qualified property for the purposes of special depreciation allowance, so his property's unadjusted basis is its cost. All right, use GDS and half your convention to figure Jay's depreciation. So, again, maker system, we're gonna use the GDS. All right, so if we're looking at that, uh, based on going back to our little, um, yep, so we're back on what on page 14, 12. Okay, I got a property class is seven year. All right, so GDS, seven year. What's our next part here? Date placed in service, 8 11 16. Recovery period, seven years. All right, so what is our method and convention? Mm -hmm. Seven years. Seven years. Seven years. 14.29% yeah. per year. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, but what's it, what, uh, using the first chart, which line are we using? GDS. Half year, seven. Half year, that first line, correct? 200%. Yep. So, in what table does it refer us to? Down to table A1. Yep. All right. And again, software does a lot of this for you, but we have to know how to calculate because somebody comes in that doesn't have any history. So our first year is 0.1429, or better known as 14.29%, okay? So there's where we do that. And typical IRS form, you got about six lines that you're just moving the 10,000 down the road. On with that, okay? All right. So a couple good exercises there on 14, 18, 19, and 20. Okay, all right, and then we have on page 1423, we have a 4562, okay? Depreciation and amortization, okay? If you wanna write above or below this, we're just like the Schedule B, we're just like the Schedule D, so if I'm using those rules for our class, where is depreciation gonna go? It goes on the 4562, but it does not go on the 4562, okay? That's a tax-wise rule. So it's a worksheet. Exactly, okay? Just like we know from the B, we have that little worksheet. The D, we have our capital gains worksheet. 4562, I want you to remember, because sometimes I will see returns come in from an office and they make a 4562 for every single depreciable asset, okay? Don't need that, and we'll see that when we get into the software, okay? Because what happens here, let me show you, okay? All right. Because if you do that, your tree on the left, it drives you absolutely nuts. Sure, you want to do that? Okay, so I got my 4562. So I went into my depreciation on my Schedule C. I have my 4562, okay? 
So we have it there, all right? See where it says depreciation of property. For accurate computation, I think we like accurate computation. 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 We gotta hit F9 for the worksheet. What line are we on? Uh, we're in a 4562, right. line six. When you go on the tax wise, there's a little worksheet, okay? And this is, like I said, this is the great part about this worksheet. And you can list all the property you want to have. Exactly, so 4562, maybe I have consultation. That's my business. Then I can, anything that relates to my business there, I can make a worksheet for each one. It's like with rental properties. Would I do it for rental properties? Yes, I do it. So because each line, each one has a column. So if I have one, two, three Main Street, I'm going to go to my depreciation, and I'm going to say up here, whoops, I'm going to go back one level, excuse me. Do, do, do. Business activity for which this relates, I might put 123 Main Street or ABC Consulting or whatever, okay? Then once I'm in there, I can go back every time to this line six, get a worksheet, and then that way I can complete everything, okay? So if you do a worksheet for each property, how does that come back to this one, four, five, six, two for all the properties? No, I'm doing a four, five, six, two for each property. Each property. I'm doing a worksheet for each depreciable asset. Okay. Because if you look at this, what's the first thing? I'm describing it. Right. I might put one, two, three, Main Street, Main Street, duplex. I might put refrigerator, I might put carpet, I might put siding. That's on the worksheet. Exactly. Right? So then it just all falls underneath our 4562. So now when it comes back to the 4562, it just shows a description of property, cost of business use, collecting cost of yeah. That 4562 becomes a summary, kind of like our Schedule D when we do that capital so gains. So when, yes. when, when the IRS looks at that, they just look at these totals. They need the more information. That's when they request mm -hmm. the worksheet. Yeah. Exactly. Worksheets are not included in the electronic filing. No, because yeah. okay. a lot of times when we see new clients, right. um, we have clients come in. Our software, when we print it for our file copy, okay. creates these great little worksheets, and I can tell what everything is. But if somebody has a, that's just get forty five sixty twos from print out, then it becomes a guessing game. So often, what I'll do is I'll submit a spreadsheet that shows property and all the expenses across that property. Mm -hmm. and everything on that. And the end, I'll show also capital expenditure in case we you know, increase the, the basis. And then I'll show the previous basis and a new basis back based on the capital cost. Yep. And that's and the other thing too, when you're talking about what you were just talking about with the basis, right. if I have a 4562 and then I have my asset worksheets, right. if I get rid of that building, then I can go down into my asset worksheets and what do I have? Sale exchange. Okay, so I now have a button and I can keep relating it back and then it creates what we have to recapture. But, the, the items you expense, if I don't have law, well, how would you put in the capital expenditure to relate to a 4562? Because it's all in the same one. So it's all in the worksheet? Yes. Okay, so in the worksheet you have the stuff to expense on the year. Well, for each item, you, you, you know, you're trying to put everything on in one worksheet, okay. again. The 4562, if I have 123 Main Street, right. and everything relating to that, each has a separate asset worksheet. So each asset worksheet, well, you're doing that. For, like for every fridge, every stove, everything I put into that property, mm -hmm. you're going to create another worksheet. Yep, you should see my depreciation sheets for some of my farmers. Yeah, well, I can imagine. So now, and then one of the, those, those worksheets may be capital cost expenditure. Right? So, in other words, I I put a new roof on. Oh yeah, that yeah yeah. Okay, versus okay. Now that increases my basis for the problem. Yes, now it does. It, it it well, but again, it's being depreciated on its own because of the time placed in service. Correct. It's not going to go right on to the other asset worksheet and increase its basis. That's why I say when you go to sell it, you have to make sure that you not only get the original basis depreciation, you get all those other ones. Exactly. So that it applies. That's why it's so much better to put all the worksheets under 14562. Okay. Because otherwise, when you go to sell it, if somebody's done all these 4562s, it's an absolute nightmare. Because you have to now go set go separate on each one of them. Okay. So that's where that's in there. All right. 1425. 
we have uh, business use of home, okay? Um, talks about the form 8829. Uh, regular use to qualify under the regular use test, a specific area of the home must be used for business on a regular basis. Incidental or occasional business use is not regular use. Regular use. All facts and circumstances must be considered in determining whether a use is on a regular basis. This is my bedroom rule, okay? Contrary to popular belief with some of my clients, a daybed in your office is not a filing cabinet, okay? Because they will say, well, nobody ever sleeps on the bed. I just have all the papers stacked on. It's a screen. It's, it's, it is a bedroom, okay? Because if you're using it and converting it to a bedroom when grandma comes, your sister comes, so, okay, all right. So it looks like an office, but the office chair is the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. How's that, isn't there an old adage about if it smells like something and it? Yeah, see it says it doesn't have to be marked off, so you don't have to have a separate floor walking it up from the house on one day. Yeah. It says you don't have to mark it off with a permanent position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, the area used for business can be a room or other separately identifiable space, okay? Sometimes this comes into play for me when I have somebody that has a large garage is attached to their house and they're doing woodworking out of it, you know, and they're saying, well, that's my, you know, for my business, that's my business workshop. And, well, and again, you know, I'm saying, okay, you know, I have to ask them, is your vehicle parked in there? Okay, that's fine. All right. You got your snowblower for the house in there? Well, that's, you know, so all of a sudden we're shrinking down. And, you know, I said, okay, and the rafters above it, are you storing the things to make your widgets or you got Christmas decorations up there? You know, so you're kind of, you know, you start to pare it down. So this 10,000 square foot pole barn that you built to attach to the house for your business may not really truly be that. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Um, on page 1427, it's kind of a little bit of what we talked about earlier. Once you've met all the tests, um, the next step is figuring out how much to deduct. Um, electing, you may elect to use the simplified method as an alternative to the calculation, allocation, and substantiation of actual expenses. The option to figure the deduction using the simplified method can may be made each tax year. Okay. All right. Using the simplified method, five dollars per square foot, and again, to a maximum of fifteen dollars. $1,500 is a Yeah, that's a big office. Oh, right. Well, no, it's not only a big office, it's also a lot of the utilities and everything else. Right. Is it based on square footage? Is it also $5 based on square footage all year? That's, I see. Well, the $1,500 doesn't actually mean you did the $5 per square foot. 1500 maximum may, may mean all the utilities and everything else included. So the area used to figure the deduction is limited to 300 square feet. So yeah, you're 1500. 1500. Yep. Um, I think they get some of that. When you look at all these, um, the uh, little strip office things they build everywhere, what do you typically see on the signs? That you're, they're, they're selling you the rate by what? Per square foot. Yeah, you, you know, you see 12 to $15 is usually that square foot range. So they're saying a home is cheaper than the $14.75? Well, well, let me ask you this. If you, if you have people coming, say you have a home office and people like, treat patients and stuff like that, you should be able to deduct a lot of the snow clearing and everything. Right? There's things, again, it's percentage. Yeah. Yeah, when you look at that 8829, you know, it, it it's not what you just think the simple part of it, okay? Now, I did go round and round one time with a client that uh, similar to what you were talking about, he had a home office that he was basically, you know, that's where his clients came to. Um, and he renovated the bathroom that was attached to that office. And what do you think we determined on that bathroom that's strictly attached to that office? Shower. Okay. What if there was uh, not only access from the office, but from another hallway? 
you know, the partial use of the office versus the rest of the house yeah. or have that downstairs. Yeah, so you got to kind of, you know, when you start looking at that stuff, you got to really, you know, make sure you pick it apart because you don't want to just give them, oh, okay, so you added a bathroom to the home office and, you know, that's, that's direct. But what if you got three bathrooms in the house anyway and you added this bathroom to the home office? You could argue that. Yeah. So, it, you know. Again, you know, you have to really look at it because to something like that to take a 100% direct, uh, that's pretty tough to do. Okay. Yep. All right. So again, we talked about the 8829, the business use of the home. If you look on the bottom of 1430, okay, you can see all these things that for the home office would come into play. All right. And when you're looking at nine through 22, or excuse me, nine through 21, a lot of items there, isn't there? Okay, it's not just what you typically think on your home office, all right? What's another one that's in there that sometimes people forget? Insurance. So this is the one opportunity where I have homeowner's insurance? Oh, insurance? Yeah, okay. They forget. What's that? They forget insurance? Yeah, yep, okay. And rent, all right? Because if you don't pay for the, if you don't own the house, you're not doing mortgage interest and property taxes, okay? All right. Well, would PMI be part of an insurance? No, because that's typically going to be in a mortgage interest. All right. Clergy. This does not do clergy justice. All right. Okay. Most members of the clergy are employees and should receive forms W-2 with their religious organizations. Some churches will withhold federal and state income tax and some will not, okay? If no income tax is withheld, the clergy member should make estimated payments if no FICA, which is what? Social Security and Medicare, yeah. uh, is withheld and no, and so Schedule E must be completed because where are they gonna pay it? All right, the value of lodging provided by the church or housing allowance to the extent it is used to pay rent or house payments Furniture payments, utilities, and other expenses of maintaining a home is not subject to income tax if the clergy member performs religious duties and functions. The clergy must pay self-employment tax on their wages, fees received, housing allowance, or the furniture lodging unless an election is to not be covered is made stating that the clergy member is conscientiously originally opposed to the acceptance of any public insurance. Okay? Members of religious orders who have taken a vow of poverty are not subject to self-employment tax on wages received for their services performed as an agent of the order and they are turned over to the order, okay? Esther does a lot of clergy and you know she'll always talk about examples that she does and a lot of them come back to the point that their W-2 income may be very small and they're getting a $60,000 a year housing allowance. Does that make sense? Okay, $5,000 a month to cover, to cover the uh, basically the pay or rent of a house, furniture payments, utilities, and other expenses maintaining a home. At $5,000 a month, that's a nice house. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So. Uh, Self-employment health insurance deduction, we talked about a little bit of that when we did the adjustment to income. So this is where, because we don't put health insurance on the Schedule C, it has to go there. Okay. Let me, let me ask you this. You're self-employed, and oh no, you're not self-employed if you work for an escort, if you're on an escort, right? Or are you? Yeah, okay, you're self-employed. You have an escort. But if you have an escort and you're getting a W-2 from it, where are you taking the health insurance deduction? The escort. Because it's coming out of the escort. Which is the smartest thing to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it's much better to lower that income than it is to make an adjustment to income there. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, self-employment tax, 14-36, okay. Basically, again, self-employment tax, take your profit, multiply by 0.9235, 
then you figure that that is uh, self-employment tax is 0.153 of that. And if it's over 118,500, then you must pay the additional 0.029. Then we have a 50% of that, okay? Patrick's going, wait, wait a sec, what now? Okay, those are the percentages. So 50% of if you're self-employed. Self yeah. so that goes on to the adjustment of income. Because if you're W2, you're employed, you should pay the Exactly, exactly. So you only, that's why it's trying to make it clear that so basically it's the 15.3, so you're actually paying half of it. Half of the 15.3, but first it's adjusted by what? 0.9235. So it's not all 100% of your profits. There is an adjustment that starts off there at 0.2935. But that's not really that much of an adjustment. No, it's but almost 10% I mean, though. Would you rather pay tax on that extra 10%? No, I'd rather cheat. Okay. All right. That's in a later chapter, Patrick. Okay. All right. So again, they got you some things. They do calculations on here. Like I said, the biggest thing is whatever our profit is, we're going to pay Social Security and Medicare tax on it. And remember, this is something that we're not, is a tax we're not going to eat up with a credit. Okay. Because where's it? No. The self-employment tax? Well, you. Well, yeah, but I mean, you can, you can eat up the adjusted gross income. Yeah, you can there. Reduction, so you end up without any income at all. Well, but, but what I'm saying is, is if you look here, we did up above. Right. We did. Um, we had our tax on our income. Right. Okay. We have our refundable, our Pac-Man's eating up our tax bill. This comes under other taxes. So basically, what is it saying? Even if I've taken and I've had refundable credits eat at my tax bill, what happens? I'm still gonna pay self-employment tax. But on one total, why are the uh, tech man taking off or? After. So oh, say, I have, say I have a $3,000 tax on my income and I have a $2,000 tax self-employment tax. Well, if I got enough credits, I can eat up that income tax. But I'm going to start over again with my self-employment tax. How do you eliminate that? Because if, if you're self-employed, do you have any withholding? So let's look what's below it. So now I have a new tax number that says total tax. Oops. Okay. Now I have to eat up payments. Am I going to have withholding if I'm self-employed? No. Okay. What could I end up doing? What most self-employed people end up doing? The only thing is the estimated tax. Yep. Or, depending on their income, what else is down here below it? Earned income credit, the other half of the additional child tax credit, the thousand dollars in American opportunity. So our refundable credits can eat up our tax, but non-refundable, we can't. Okay. Either way, no matter what, you got to pay some self. Yeah. Well, and why? Because you're paying into the Medicare and the Social Security system. Okay. All right. Okay. So we have self-employment. We got some exercises. And that is it. All right. So we're done with 14. Let's take about five minutes. All right. That's pretty good for self-employment or for depreciation. All right, so we'll take five minutes. What I'm gonna do with this one is I'm just gonna kind of use the Schedule C in this 4562. So I'm just gonna kind of, we'll just kind of talk through these, all right? If you have your J.P. Barnum uh, problem there, you can put it right into it, all right? And J.P. was 12, or 13-3, right? Yep. So 14 to ace, or 14 three just kind of works right into it. Okay. All right. So if we read through it here, what do we got? Well, JP Barnum, we know is self-employed. Due to the success of his insurance sales, he decided to buy his own store. 
So he's going to become a brick and mortar as opposed to working out of his home. All right. He purchased a small office building in his hometown. The cost of the building was 33000 The building was, will be solely used for his business. And then he did the following upgrades before opening. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So if you go to it, we're on the Schedule C. All right. So on that Schedule C, we're in again, and like I said at the outset, depreciation, we want to think of it as an expense. Don't get caught up in the language. Think of it as an expense. Okay. We look at line 13. Whoop. We look at line 13 um, on our Schedule C, Part 2. And once we see there, we see depreciation and sex one, Section 179 expense deduction. Okay. All right. Okay. So we have that. Okay, so we're going to go in there. We're going to hit F9. What's it give us? 4562. Okay. And again, everything goes on the 4562 for depreciation, but nothing goes on it. All right. So business or activity to which this form relates. What was it? Insurance sales, right? And again, this is where you kind of create a header, if you will. You know, it's kind of like uh, the cloud. What do you do for different things? You create a folder for it. All right. So we're creating a folder for our insurance sales, things we're going to depreciate in there. And that's what our 4562 is. Now, after we've created that, we're going to go down to where it says description of property. Okay. And again, it says to us, for accurate computation, F9 to worksheet. I like the idea for accurate computation. So I'm going to go in there, hit F9, I get my little asset worksheet, and that pops it right up. Okay? So we got our business asset worksheet. What's the first thing we're going to put in there, probably? What did he buy first? Good. Office building, right? Okay. So we got the office building. All right. Okay, so we have our office building. Whoops. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, date placed in service. Doesn't have it in here. Should. Um, we're going to say that he bought it, uh, let's see, shopped around. What's a good time? When's a good time to buy office buildings, Patrick? Is there a time of the year that's better than others? Okay. We're going to say he bought it January 1st then of the tax year. Okay. So that's his date placed in service. All right. Now, asset type. If you hit it, what happens? Yeah, drop down. And this is where we have a bunch of options, okay? All right. Patrick, how many airplanes and helicopters are you depreciating for your business? Okay. All right. None? So, uh, we got appliances for rentals, autos, buses. You can see carpeting rental, a bunch of different things that are in there, okay? Um, obviously, What's this driven by as you get a little farther into it, we have fruit bearing shrubs, so tree or vine, so that vineyard that you have in the backyard, Patrick. Okay, all right. Uh, goats and sheep, hogs, horses, all right. Actually, we had somebody that was uh, dealt with racehorses. It was kind of interesting to get into, to, to kind of learn that, all right. We got some Indian reservation stuff, information systems, tangibles, land, land improvements. All right. Okay. Leasehold. But what do we have here? Exactly. So we're going to select that. Okay. And we've done that. Now it asks us on the next one. If the property is real estate. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry. We're going to see the little thing here. 
if a rental asset, and we'll see this for that next line when we do rental properties, because it'll pull down a little menu. Remember, Patrick, you were asking me about relating it to whatever. It'll make sure that it goes to the appropriate parent property, okay? Um, is this real estate residential rental? Nope, okay. What is our cost basis? On the whole business? Mm -hmm. I would add a little in. What do you think, Mark? The business is already running. Business is already running, yes. So anything you buy during that year of operating business should be part of the cost basis. Um, the the expense, well, you know, the expense is computed in the front of it. Yeah, yeah, so how would the, the 33,000? Yeah, my expense is right. Well, and again, you know, this business is a success. Yep. Okay. So let's just, we'll do them separate. Okay. So we have, um, what do we say? We're going to just put the 33,000 for the building. Yeah. Okay. All right. So if you look after you selected your property and your date placed in service. Okay. What did it do for you? All right. Okay. What's the first thing we probably have to do? What's worth red? Mine's not red, but what's red on yours? So we're putting in 33,000, okay? All right, and what do we do with the salvage or land value? Depreciate you take it out, if there is any land value. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna use that 10% rule. Oh, okay. 10%, all right, yeah. so that's the assumption generally. Yep, we're just gonna kind of use that, okay? So we got our land value. What's the uh, next part that's in there? Okay, what's the next line down? This is where I was talking about that business use. Okay. What percentage is the business use? Exactly, and why, is that, why do we have to determine that? What was that threshold? We kept talking about that 50%. Okay, and in this case, he's using it solely for business, so it's 100, okay? This is where when you do somebody that has a duplex that live in half of it, you do 50% or, you know, it's kind of that direct, indirect, okay? We have that. What is our method? Makers? All right. How many years? And what is our convention? Yep. Okay. So you can see his current depreciation. Obviously, there's no prior and next year's depreciation. All right. Is it eligible for special depreciation allowance? Okay, and it's not eligible for a section 179. All right, and you can see those are down there at the bottom. All right, okay, so kind of answer that for you. All right, now, what do we got next? Paint. What are we gonna do with the paint? Expense. So we'll put that as expense. What about the sign and the awning? Well, more than 2,500 is in so you have to expense that, but you have to. Appreciate that? Yeah. Yep, okay. Yep, so what we're gonna do is hit a copy of the asset worksheet, and that's gonna keep us, and if you look on your tree on the left, so if I hit that little tab right above there, I got a new asset worksheet, all right? And what shows up on my tree on the left? Remember I was saying about the hierarchy? I have my 4562, and now I'm starting to get asset worksheets underneath it, okay? Because what would happen with this building since he owns it down the road? Possibly. Good seller might sell. And if we have those asset worksheets there together on that 4562, we can make sure, all right, that we, we get those recapture things in there. All right, so we have that. So what do we got next? Sign and awning. Yep, so like I said, go up to the tab right above it where it says copy asset worksheet. Yep, right above, you know, the add form, and then the next door was copy it, kind of like we do with W-2s. And what pops up there? Pops up, and where does it leave it for us? Right underneath that 4562. Okay, and that's where that's a great tab to use. All right, so we got a sign and awning. He bought that as part of the original. So what is our asset type? Yeah, sign an awning. Furniture and fixtures. 
Mm. Not really. It's become a part of the original. So what are we going to probably put it under? Real property, non-residential. Yeah. Yep, and he did it when he bought the property at the beginning of the year. <laughs> it's not rental. We're going to do uh, 4,300. Okay, 100%. Obviously, there's no land attached to it. So we kind of have it where we have that. And again, is this eligible for anything on the special depreciation? No. Okay. What do we have next? So again, I'm going to go with a white tab up at the top above the, the S on the, uh, just underneath the, the tiles. We have office furniture. Okay. And in our asset type, what do we have in there? Yep, okay. All right, and he bought that one again. We're gonna go one, one, because he bought it, he did it when he bought the property, okay. All right, and how much did he spend, 5,200? Okay. Now, what lit up at the bottom? Mm -hmm. And what would this one be? Half year. Half year, okay, yep. But what also is lit up a little farther down? And what else? You got the special depreciation there? So now we got a decision to make. All right. Is this, this is new furniture? Mm-hmm. Does it have to be new for the special depreciation? No. No, new year's. As long as you didn't buy it from my family. <laughs> <laughs> so why should you want 179 and the computer's in front? What's that? I just found 179 back in. Let me go back here. Uh, let's see here. You can buy a building for 32,000. Uh, section 179, it may be either new or used. Uh, buh, buh, buh. The special appreciation allows applies to only new property, not used. Yeah, so that's why we have to have a decision on that. So special new, one seventy nine what? New or used? New or used? Exactly. Okay. So what would you do for the best advantage of the one seventy nine? Well, we're going to kind of talk about it. All right. Again, he has a lot of income and stuff like that. Okay. So we have a choice to make. We take the special depreciation. So let's check that box and see what happens. Okay, so we're gonna say yes. All right, so what happens right below it? Base of property for special, special depreciation. So what did it take? So if you look at one and two right above below special depreciation, what's the numbers that are there? Got our basis and half of it, right? Did I get that for you, Mark? Yeah, I said uh, I checked the yes box. So what you... Yes, get it back up. Neutral. Because oh. you're trying to appreciate in the future. Remember, you're oh. in 2016. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Now go down. Okay, good. Yeah. So now that works. Okay. All right. Okay. You're like, where did it go? Yes. All right. So we have it. We can see. Now, what else shows up though? Too. We go back up to line six and seven there. 
our depreciation is up there right below our convention. What do we see? We start with our basis for depreciation is the other half. First year, second year, okay? All right. So basically, what are we getting for total depreciation on this, the first year? What's the amount? So we're getting the uh, 2,600. Plus what? Plus the 372. Exactly, okay? All right. And 72 first year. Yep, exactly, okay? Now, what if we say no there? Is this eligible for a 179? All right. Patrick Patrick likes that 179. <laughs> okay. All right. So what are we able to do? So on the 179, what happens? So we're not taking special. Where is it going to be calculated at? Even though it's checked as yes, where is it calculated? Down here at the bottom. It doesn't automatically do that. Why? Well, it does, depends on income, but it also depends on what? What's the other thing we talked about? Usually people think of 179 in what way? 100%. Right. Oh, unless you want to think of special exactly. 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 Say that we say for income purposes for him because he's got some of these other expenses with opening his new office. Right. Let's leave some of it because his business is growing. We might need some more of it next year. Right. So you take the percentage of the 179 and take the rest of the special. Yeah. So special if you. Appreciation then, special no. Okay. So if we put down there, say that we're going to take, first year we're going to take, we can do F5, let's take 75% of it. Okay. So if I do that and I end up with 3,900 here, okay. So that's how much I wanted to take on my 179. What happens back up here on the basis? There's the remaining 1,300. Yep. And then my first year, yep, yep. See how because see how they just took. We're basically taking this fifty two hundred dollar expense, and what are we doing? Trying to figure out how we want to break it up and when we want to use it each year. Where did you change this to seventy five percent? Oh, I just went down here, uh -huh. right here. Yeah. Put that five. Oh, okay. Bring up your little calculator, okay. and then you're going to take your basis of the fifty two hundred. Multiply by 175. There you go. Okay. All right. And then perfect place to calculate. Okay. Because yes. then again, you, you know, you can manipulate it. And you know, what else can we do with this? What's another great tool that TaxWise has that we can use in this depreciation when we're talking about special versus section 179? What's the other? What if mode? Yeah. So we can kind of do that so that we get in there till we determine what we want to do. So in our file and what if. Okay. All right, and computers and printers, probably very much the same thing. All right, so, you know, Schedule C's, this is, you know, most of the time, what are you gonna see on a Schedule E for depreciation? Because a lot of people with sole proprietors typically do not have their own building. But what are you gonna see most of? Probably, probably furniture, computers. Yeah, yeah, you know, those things that, so you don't see with sole proprietors a lot of depreciation. If they got an exclusive one, yeah. 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 Um, it's like with computers and printers, I'd probably take that as a 179 before office furniture on them because within a year, computers and printers are probably going to be obsolete. Yeah, and that's what I talked about earlier about software. Right. You know, you get into some of that stuff and technology, you know, I, I, some of the rules are probably a little archaic because each year goes by, technology has a shorter and shorter useful right. life. I think so, the office furniture is probably going to last for four or five years, so you might as well depreciate the balance of that. But the computers and printers, if you decide to take half of it for depreciation, then, then you got to screw it around with the recapture on that because now you got new stuff coming in. What did you get, what, what did you get for the old stuff? Mm -hmm. So I guess even with a 179, you got to do that. Yeah. yeah. But in most cases, you just toss it. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, that's where we had the conversation earlier. Printers have almost become large cartridges because it's more cost effective to buy the whole printer with the temporary cartridge or whatever than it is sometimes depending on how you use it to buy the new replacement cartridge. So especially when you get into lasers, that just, they know they got, that's where they, that must be where they make most of their money. So 
Plus, some of the laser furnace, if you have to look, say that there's not this, this stuff in it, mm -hmm. it'll have a date on it. It can work out whether or not it's been there for a while, and that it'll keep tossing it out regardless of what's inside. The yeah, the, the, the actual character. Yeah. The sum of the pitch. I mean, because it's got some sort of some way of detecting how long it's been there, mm -hmm. it'll toss it out and you have to get a new one. Yep. Or pull it out and put it back in and reset. Shake them up. That's what I do. That's right. Especially those laser ones. Yep. Yep. When we're office with the lasers, you know, somebody will call me from one of the offices that I have support for during tax season. Right. You know, my cartridge is out. Did you order another one? No. Take it out and shake it. There's another 500 pages in there. Yep. Yep. The you know every everybody has IT knowledge. Turn it on. Turn it off. Take the cartridge out and shake it. So, and that's about the extent of my IT. So, so computers and printers, we just make another worksheet mm -hmm. and then categorize it to categorize it in computer software. Nope. Office equipment. Nope. Yeah, I am. Remember, I said that archaic term? Yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, like I said, when I, as soon as somebody said the uh, first time I heard data handling, the first thing I thought of, I'm going, I picture, you know, a PC the size of this room, somebody yeah. standing in there feeding punch cards, uh -huh. you know, data yeah. handler, right. okay. you know, coming in with their little stack of cards with all the things and putting it in there. So I'm that's what we did. Yeah. The last year engineer. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, I can even remember, you know, taking, you know, the old Pascal and PL1 and, C and stuff like that programming language. You went to computer lab and, you know, there's like, you had to wait in line most of the time because there was only, even on the college, there was terminals on each side and in the middle there's this big room, that this thing that looked like a overgrown refrigerator. Sure. Yep, you know, and the guy that's sitting in that room has got a stocking cap and jacket on because, you know, it, it's running at about a thousand degrees in there, you know, and they got it, the temperature down to keep it cool, so. Yep, all right. So that's really the depreciation that we're talking about, okay? Again, Schedule C's, we don't see a lot of depreciation other than, you know, these little business assets, okay? Uh, we're gonna get into a lot more variety with the Schedule E's, with the rents, okay? All right.